Welcome. I'm Esther Allen, a professor at City University of New York, and I'm here with Allison Markin Powell, who translates Japanese literature and works with the Penn Translation Community. She and I are co-organizers of Translating the Future. Thank you, Esther, and thank you all for joining us for what was once long ago meant to be the kickoff event for an in-person conference this week, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the World of Translation, which in 1970 was billed as the first international conference on literary translation held in the United States. Instead, we're here for the finale week of Translating the Future, which due to circumstances we're all very well aware of, ended up launching online four months ago on the actual anniversary of the May 1970 World of Translation Conference. At this evening's event, host Monolingual New York, we'll hear about several linguistic communities among the hundreds that together make up the city where this conference has been based. Like other city dwellers around the world, we New Yorkers are now wondering what the landscape of our city will look like once we're able to emerge and recover from the effects of these pandemic months. But we do know for certain that that landscape will be post-monolingual because as this evening's speakers will confirm, it always has been. We are particularly grateful to the Princeton University Program in Translation and Intercultural Communication for generously sponsoring today's conversation. And we have long been fortunate to have as one of the central partners in this conference, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. We will soon hear from Marx from the director, Salvatore Shibona, who will introduce tonight's speakers. Tonight's conversation will be followed by a Q&A. Please email your questions for Ava Chin, Jasmine Claude Narcisse, Lisandro Perez, and Damien Searles to translatingthefuture2020 at gmail.com. We'll keep questions anonymous unless you note in your email that you would like us to read your name. Translating the Future is convened by PEN America's Translation Committee, which advocates on behalf of literary translators, working to foster a wider understanding of their art, and offering professional resources for translators, publishers, critics, bloggers, and others with an interest in international literature. The committee is currently co-chaired by Lynn miller Lachman and Larissa Kaiser. For more information, look for translation resources at pen.org. If you know anyone who is unable to join us for today's live stream or any of the other conversations that have been part of this conference, recordings are available on the HowlRound and Center for the Humanities sites, as well as on Penn's archive. Before we turn it over to Salvatore, we'd like to offer our utmost and eternal gratitude to our partners at the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library and PEN America, and also to the masters of dark Zoom magic at HowlRound who have made this live stream possible. And now, Salvatore. Hello, thank you to Esther and Allison for organizing this vital conference and also for your pluck at reshaping it so briskly last spring into this virtual event. Uh, we at the Coleman Center are immensely proud to have co-sponsored this um, whole series with Penn and the Center for the Humanities. I am the Sue Ann and John Weinberg Director of the Coleman Center. As some of you know, the, the Coleman Center selects 15 fellows a year for a nine month term. Our new fellows have just arrived. Fellows receive an office inside the New York Public Library, the big one at 42nd Street and Fifth Avenue, intensive access to our collections and a living stipend of $75,000 so they can focus exclusively on their work during their fellowship terms. The fellows are some of the best and most promising academics, independent scholars, poets, playwrights, journalists, dramatists, artists, and fiction writers at work today. We have also for a long time supported the work of translators with our fellowship, including a number of participants in Translating the Future, such as recently Damien Searles, Jennifer Croft and Susan Bernofsky, as well as the non-translation work of other panelists here, including Eva Chin and Lisandro Perez. To those watching this from abroad, the Coleman Center welcomes applicant, applicants from accomplished scholars and writers from any country who have a need for the resources of the New York Public Library, home to the fourth largest library collection in the world. 
Now, I'm delighted to present our four panelists for this evening who will appear in the following order. First, Ava Chin, who teaches at CUNY and is the author of the MF MFK Fisher Book Award winning Eating Wildly and a forthcoming book about her family's century long life in New York City's Chinatown. Jasmine Claude Narcisse, who has taught throughout the CUNY system and works in the field of second language acquisition in French and Francophone literatures. Her publications include Memoir de Femme in collaboration with Pierre Richard Narcisse, an account of interviews, research, and oral histories of and on Haitian women in history. Lisandro Perez, who teaches at John Jay College and whose most recent book in 2018 was the fulfillment of his Coleman Center research in 2004 and 5, titled Sugar, Cigars, and Revolution, the Making of Cuban New York. It won the 2018 Herbert H. Lehman Prize for Distinguished Scholarship in New York History. And finally, Damien Searles, a translator of many books from German, French, Norwegian, and Dutch, and the winner of the Helen and Kurt Wolf Translators Prize for his translation of Uwe Janssen's four volume novel, Anniversaries, which Damien worked on at his, during his Common Center Fellowship in 2013 to 14. Now, please welcome Ava Chen. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so glad to be here with you tonight. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, my book, my latest book, uh, which is about my family's experience um, under the Chinese Exclusion Act laws um, and how they landed here in New York City's Chinatown. So um, this, my book um, is again, um, about the impact of the Chinese Exclusion Act laws, um, which started in 1882 um, and went, it lasted at least until 1943, but had lasting implications uh, for the Chinese community in, this, uh, in our nation, um, as well as implications, heavy implications for my family. Um, the, the, um, I want to talk to you about uh, the various languages that were present um, in New York City's Chinatown. Uh, when we say in English Chinese, uh, this of course is a shorthand um, for many of the different languages and dialects of Chinese that were spoken back then as well as today. Um, so if we can move on to slide number two. Thank you. Um, so the languages and the dialects that I'm talking about um, in the uh, mid to late part of the 19th century um, in China originated from this particular region. It's called the Pearl River Delta area of China. You can see that it's not too far away from Macau and also Hong Kong. Uh, this is where some of the earliest um, immigrants from China came, worked on uh, the, in the gold mines um, in the 1840s, um, and also worked on the railroad. Um, if we take a look at the next slide, um, you can see on the left, uh, there is a larger detail. Um, you can see uh, where the Pearl River Delta is. It's in the Southeast Asian region. Uh, the climate is very much like Southeast Asia. Um, it's very tropical. Um, at the time in which people were migrating in the mid to late 19th century, people were fleeing China because of civil war, drought and famine, uh, the effects of imperialism and inter-ethnic warfare. Um, folks uh, landed um, in places like the United States, largely on the West Coast. Um, and unfortunately, uh, in, by the 1880s, this was a decade of terror for Chinese. Um, this was a period in time in which uh, there were massacres, lynchings, uh, wholesale rounding up of Chinese and pushing them out, what we would probably now call pogroms. Um, and uh, it, was, um, it was a very difficult time. So a number of very intrepid Chinese then jumped on the railroad um, and sought refuge. Um, I, I, I should tell you, I guess, um, that in this period of time, uh, there was an economic depression. Uh, there was a fight for resources. Um, 
European immigrants from the East Coast and East Coasters uh, jumped on the railroad that Chinese helped to build, including uh, my great great grandfather, um, went out west um, and found Chinese working there in jobs they thought should have belonged to them. Um, so all of these forces together um, accumulated in this decade of terror for Chinese. Uh, so then Chinese go, I make a reverse migration um, to places like New York City. Um, let's see, so if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, my family members uh, were amongst some of those early refugees that came to New York. Uh, in the 1880s and in the 1890s. Um, eventually, by 1915, we all wound up in the same tenement apartment building on the crooked foot of Mott Street. Um, it is where my family has lived continuously for over 100 years. Uh, it is where I'm lucky enough to have my writing studio, and it is also where I'm happy to be speaking to you today. Um, if we take a look at the next slide, I just wanna to talk to you about the various languages. Um, so this is the 1920 census. Um, the building, uh, this is the census for the building. Um, the building is already, uh, let's see, it's about, five, it's about five years old at this point. Um, and you can see, and it's kind of hard to see, um, but there are a variety of different languages um, that uh, native languages that people are speaking in the building. Um, there's Chinese, there's Italian, there's Russian. Um, if you, we don't have this right now, but if I was able to, uh, give you the other pages of the census for the building, you would also see Austrian, German um, being spoken, um, and maybe a tiny bit of English, right? Um, in terms of the Chinese dialects that are being spoken, um, again, uh, Chinese is just this uh, blanket term uh, for a number of different dialects that are coming from Guangdong province, right? What we used to call Canton, right, which is we call Guangzhou. Um, the area around uh, Guangzhou um, was like an area called, we call it Samyap, which means like the three county area right around the city. A large number of Chinese um, came from that, uh, that region and they spoke a particular dialect of Cantonese. Um, and then later on people from the, what we call the Sa uh, Seyap, uh, region, the four counties region where my family came from, from Toisan, um, a lot of us, a lot of people spoke that dialect. Um, and then there were people who were not Cantonese, but who were Hakka, um, and they spoke their dialect. Um, if we knew, may move to the next slide, um, I just want to uh, kind of um, show you an image um, of, uh, well, I would say typical family, but I don't think we were that typical. Um, I am using my family as a lens uh, to uh, investigate the time period. Um, and this is the Dosham family, the M family. Um, and uh, this is my great grandparents uh, on either side of the matriarch and patriarch who are their um, uncle and aunt. Uh, you can see that the uncle and aunt in the center of the frame are an interracial couple. Um, it was second marriages for both of them. Um, and uh, when um, my great grandfather who's in the bow tie, wearing the bow tie on the left, first came to this country, um, he studied uh, in, he went to prep school uh, in New England. Um, so his English language, his English language skills were impeccable, but he was originally from those villages in Toisan that I had, you know, had shown you um, on the map. Um, when he came and he lived with his aunt and uncle, um, of course, the aunt and uncle mainly spoke English at home and in an effort, um, you know, not to ostracize uh, or make the aunt feel uh, like an, um, you know, an outsider in her own home, uh, the lingua franca was English. Um, on the right hand side holding the baby is my great grandmother. She was Hakka, but she was originally from Hong Kong. Um, and uh, she was a midwife uh, trained by uh, missionaries from the London Missionary Society. Um, so she spoke Hakka and Cantonese, pure Cantonese from Hong Kong, um, but she also spoke, uh, because Hong Kong was a British colony, she also spoke English. Um, they are one of the few families 
in the building. Uh, certainly one of the few Chinese families in the majority Chinese building um, in the uh, 1920s who spoke English at home. Um, let's see, uh, if we can move to uh, the next slide. Um, one of the, uh, Chinatown is um, uh, a society that um, has a number of associations. And so these associations um, are grouped together in a variety of ways. You have family associations, village associations, work associations. Um, and this particular building um, is the association for um, three families, including my Chin family. Um, the associations were really important because during the exclusion period, Chinese people wholesale weren't allowed to come to the United States and legally emigrate. Um, so when they landed and discovered this incredibly inhospitable environment, um, they needed to um, network with each other in all of their different ways. So um, an immigrant coming from our villages would have landed in New York, gone immediately to the family or the village association, found a bed, found a meal, and found an access to jobs and employment. Um, in those these associations, they would have been speaking their village dialects. Um, and maybe they would have been speaking Cantonese as well, because they would have known both. One of the things I was really fascinated by was this idea of um, what we call the generation poem. Um, and if, uh, 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 Travis, if we can um, move to the video number one. Um, I just want to describe to you, uh, and, and we don't, I'll tell you when to, to play in a second. Um, I want to describe to you what a generational poem is. So, um, in China, there is something called the generational poem where the first two, there, there are two characters in your given name, right? Not your surname, but your first name. Um, and one of those characters will be the same character for all of the folks in your generation. This includes your siblings. This also includes your neighbors um, in, the, in the town and anybody else who has your surname. Okay, and so um, that character again is the same for all of these different people um, of that generation. Uh, it is um, a poem that children learn by heart. I should also qualify that this is something that exists mainly, mainly for the men um, of the village, uh, but in certain cases I've known um, women uh, who have also had uh, th this, this, this kind of naming um, convention. So um, I went back uh, to China, to our villages um, uh, about uh, in 2017 on um, a Fulbright uh, fellowship. And I interviewed um, different farmers from our villages to see, um, you know, what they knew about our family members. Um, and I asked them to recite the generation poem. Um, and so if we can listen to this first one. Can we just ask him to uh, recite the generation poem? Yeah. He Okay, thank you. All right. So, um, just going to wait. Okay, so it comes back. So, this generation of poem is incredibly important because it tells you where you are um, in the generations that came before you. And it also tells you your placement in terms of the, gen the future generations that will come after you. So an immigrant into the United States 
is always gonna know uh, his or her place, largely his, um, in terms of the history of the family, but also the history of the villages. And what that farmer was able to tell us was um, 20 generations. All right, let's take a look um, at the next one. Um, and this was from my, uh, my grandfather's village. And you'll see that this farmer, he speaks really fast. Uh, so, so let's just listen to it. It's, it's very quick. Did you understand, he says? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so uh, let's see, if we can move um, back to the PowerPoint, um, Allison, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so what's so important in addition to the history of the generational poem is that when you landed in New York and went to this village association, you would have gone, you would have given your name and you would have recited the poem and immediately everybody would know, oh yes, you're so-and-so and you're my father's generation or you're my generation, right? Even if we aren't totally re related to each other. Well, actually, even if you're not my brother, you're obviously related in a certain way, right? Um, and so this helps the person to have a real context, right, um, for themselves. I will tell you that in the course of my research, one of the things I, I did was I joined the family association. Um, this is very unusual because uh, for many generations, it was only men that were allowed uh, to be part of um, the, the, the family association. Um, but we did it anyway, despite my lack of, um, of language skills. Um, today, the, uh, the associations are still very multilingual. You will hear Toisanese being spoken, you will hear Cantonese, and you will hear Mandarin, right? Very little English. Um, and uh, so it's very multilingual today. The same thing is true throughout Chinatown. Um, I would say that, you know, we hear Fujianese um, in the Fujianese sections of Chinatown, and you do hear a lot more Mandarin being spoken on the street, um, not necessarily in the in the Gongsua. Um, so let's see. Okay, I just want to move on to the the next slide. Um, okay, so one of the difficulties in working on this book um, has been how to address the multilingual nature of the community, and I've had to make decisions. Do I use, um, what kind of romanization do I use, right? It's an English language book. What kind of romanizations do I use? Do I use pinyin? Pinyin was only developed in the 1950s. Um, it works very well for Mandarin. Do I use Yutping or the Yale system, which works better for Cantonese? But since most of my speakers and most of my characters in the book were speaking Toisanese, there's, there's no standardization for Toisan um, into English. Um, I've also had to, you know, make decisions about whether to, you know, write uh, using the dialect or using the official language of Mandarin. Um, now, uh, in 2018, two years ago, when I had the happy privilege of being a Coleman Fellow, um, I, uh, this all kind of came to a head for me um, as a writer when I went to the Golden Spike reenactment. Um, it was the 149th anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, which my great great grandfather had worked in. And um, I was going uh, to try to find other researchers, talk to other families uh, who had had similar experiences, gather their stories. And I, I, I didn't expect to be very, oh, if we can move back. Yeah, um, I didn't expect to be so moved by um, this, 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 uh, 
officially sanctioned uh, ceremony. But I was interviewed by a Salt Lake Tribune um, reporter, and she asked me about my great great grandfather, the railroad worker, and she asked me his name. Now I had to make a decision. Am I gonna use his name in Cantonese? In Cantonese, his name is Yun Sun. In Mandarin, it's Yuan Xin. In Toisanese, it's Yun Tlin. Now, if I was going to be really smart about it, I would have used the pinyin Mandarin version so that other researchers might be able to recognize his name if they saw it in, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, railroad um, role, right? Um, but I thought about it and I really thought about it a lot. And I thought if this project, if so much of this project is about naming the unnamed, right? Uh, writing this narrative that has largely been mm, lost, right, um, or willfully lost in certain ways. Um, if Cantonese as a language um, today, uh, in China, it certainly feels quite imperiled um, because of the forces of the official language, um, because the Chinese government really pushes Mandarin. I thought, you know, I'm just gonna say his name in his native language. I'm gonna say it in Toisan. So you can see at the bottom, you have his name, Yun Tlin. So um, I'm, that's my end of my presentation. If you move to the next slide, if you like. Um, and uh, happy to um, you know, hear from the other speakers including Jasmine, Yasmin. Thank you so very much, um, Eva. It's like I've been lost in your presentation, so I know I have to kind of gear towards <laughs> my own. Um, I, I really would like to express my heartfelt thank you to Esther for her unexpected um, invitation to join this conversation today. Uh, it is indeed an expected, unexpected opportunity for me to revisit my personal experience of the, this post-monolingual New York um, we're talking about today. Uh, not that my experience is in any way exceptional, but uh, I think in fact it is its commonality, uh, the fact that uh, that makes it worthy of attention in the sense that because it is such a common everyday experience, we tend to normalize it, to banalize it, and we know what this uh, banalization leads to. It's some kind of invisibility. And uh, invisibility is something that I think makes way to and sustain um, certain discourses that are like dominant discourse. For me, it's that breeds uh, dominant discourse. And this dominant discourse, unfortunately, they don't just stay there and be dominant discourse. They are often assimilated by weak links, at, uh, as we may call them, in linguistic power dynamic. So because I, my decision to join this conversation was a little bit kind of late, um, I would like to bring that disclaimer that what I'm going to share with you today is not really research-based. Uh, I wouldn't have enough time to kind of put the research together for that to be. It is simply my reflection and my understanding of my forever multilingual journey um, here in New York City and uh, before New York in Haiti. So I am in no way prescriptive and I don't pretend to be speaking in the name of what could be considered my community uh, here in New York. Um, in fact, I, I may have at some point, and I am going to have some very strong views on certain things and uh, I will own them. And I'm going to really ask for grace from you, from the public, from everybody, because it is the, this only genuine way I think I can speak about it for the moment. So it's gonna be really from heart. So you're going to allow me to be personal for a moment. Um, 
I never had the privilege to encounter the monolingual New York, if that ever even existed, I'm not sure. In fact, I never lived in a monolingual space, period. I was born in Haiti, in a Haitian family. Um, so really, uh, that was a bilingual family, I may say. Um, and where my mother's essential role seemed to be the strict enforce, enforcement of rules, principles, propriety about the usage of French and Creole by her children and our friends. And in fact, I, would, I should rather say, especially by us, the girls, because I realized, but only when I get much older and the damage is well already passed on, that this whole catechism was more fluid for boys and men than it was for, 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 for women. Um, after that, maybe we can uh, talk about that uh, if there were questions about it for more um, details. But later on, when I reached the age of socialization outside of the house, and this rule start, started being picked up by school and various other spaces, I realized as well um, that my mother was in fact arming us for a society where the simple, um, not so simple, I would say, linguistic performance would play as a major determining social identifier. So much naively at first, but really very consciously as I was growing up, linguistic performance became a social capital I got to take advantage of. And I would like to say that even though I don't want to slip into generalization, it is a very common, common middle-class Haitian phenomenon. Like you navigating between French and Creole and the power dynamic and what that says, what that doesn't say, and when to switch, when to start in one language and continue in the other. It's a whole science in itself, but in a way they breed that to you, the middle-class families breed that to you um, at birth. So you kind of know how to go there. So this long introduction to wheel back to the space we're living in now, which is like the monolingual New York, post-monolingual New York, pardon me, um, I immediately loved that lens uh, that invites us to liberate New York from the premises uh, of his monolinguality, um, a lens that precedes our presence um, as other on, in that space. And uh, this lens that opens, uh, opens it up and tells us like, tell us how you feel New York. And here I had this like, very Deridian thing where feel was to fill in and also to feel like how I feel it. Uh, so both words are here, but I don't know how to express that in um, the pronunciation, not being not speaking English enough. Uh, so we all agree that this monolingual New York is a fallacy, it's a myth. And I think it's interesting how within that myth, we're going to enter into that myth and trace, try to trace the multiplicity of that city instead. Um, and um, I would also say that I understand that I'm expecting to be speaking about the French New York. I realized in my conversation, in my exchange with Alison and Esther that French came up and never Creole, but my French New York, Francophonie obliges, is tied to this vicious un unavoidable French Creole power dynamic I, I told you about, I mentioned above. So I won't say French, I would say Francophone starting now. And when I say Francophone, please, I would like, since I cannot, I can only speak from my Haitian kind of stand. When I say Francophone, I ask that you hear Fran French and Creole, because for me, the, the two of them like kind of, always navigating on the same plane. So I thought I would try to talk today about the power dynamic, this, this kind of vicious power dynamic and how it unfolds here 
for a middle-aged woman, because I, I arrived in the United States pretty late, um, a middle-aged woman arriving in New York with that power dynamic. So I already had these two languages. And of course, in the meantime, I studied English. I studied Spanish. I was translating in four languages. And here I am coming into New York. And that's where this post-monolingual New York is going to be dumping to me um, in the form of a story that I call the story of loss and new mastery. What do I mean by that? When I moved here 20 years ago with my family, my mother welcomed us in her home. Lucky me, lucky us, I would say. She had immigrated here 18 years before. Uh, I would say fled would be a better word, but uh, that's a whole, another, a whole other story. We cannot go in there. And she had sweated water and blood to pave a golden path for us. I arrived in the United States with all my papers, with all my family with their papers and everything, and a house waiting for me, and you know everything you can imagine. Um, and I will be forever grateful for that. But here I was in front of her. Of course, she left. I was in my late teen years, and here I was in front of her. And naturally, the language that came to me to relate to her was French because in this, in my bilingualism, my mother was my French reference. That's how I was supposed to speak to her. And I'm part of this generation that would, uh, well, use, if I had spoken Creole to my mother, when she was in Haiti, she would look at me and ask me to speak up. Like, would you express yourself? And this, the, 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 the famous phrase was, exprime toi. That means like speak because before we didn't know what she was talking, you were talking about. So I naturally started speaking French to her because that's what, what it was. And here she was laughing at me and calling me Frenchy and telling me, oh, I forgot how like French was so precious for you. And I said to myself, wait, in the 20 years we spent apart from each other because before she left, I had left two years myself to go to college. So I had left my, my hometown to go to college. And in the 20 years like we were like apart, letters, phone conversations, wishes, even jokes sometimes were in French. So for me, the language I speak with my mother is French. But then, and then also I studied linguistics. So I started myself to realize that where to put my French and what my Creole was and what my French was. And I was translating as well. So the imbalance that was in the language in the way that they had me speak them, I had kind of arrived at a, some kind of plane, even though it cannot be really equal, but I had arrived at some kind of equilibrium between these, but this equilibrium didn't touch my relationship with my mother through the language I was French. So it was really strange and a shock for me. Now, we were in this Haitian extended family, my mother, a brother, my own family. And uh, I think like we were like almost eight of us. And the, the, the languages we spoke were French and Creole. English remained the foreign language, even though I was in New York. But inside the house, English was the foreign, was the, the tongue of school the tongue of paperwork, business, the tongue that kept that keeps coming in the mail, in a way, I was at the tongue of power as well. And then it occurred to me that my mother had to make space for English. And to do that, she just like put French aside. So English became the language of power and English is, was doing here in the United States what French was doing for her in Haiti. So I said to myself, what is it that is expecting from me now? 
And I understood you in America, you in New York, here, you speak Creole in the house, that's your intimate self. And outside of the house, you speak English. I learned to reckon with that, uh, with the fact that these expectations were actually the expectation for the diasporic Haitian communities, community here. And I want to suppose that the diversity that I, I know from New York and I just heard Eva speaking and I understand that most likely that might have been the case in maybe Chinese families at some point. Um, so I am predicting that the diversity that we represent in New York is going to be can tell us about the multiplicity of the dramatic outcomes of this kind of problem. So I, I don't really think like what happened to me was in any way some, something, anything like original. I discussed, I tried to explain and tried to bring up the possibility of alternatives, you know, all the alternatives to this binary corset, um, English Creole or English French binary corset. And it was unfruitful because I think these discussions were touching to really entrenched fra fractures, deeper wounds of the post-colonial Haitian social fabric I was um, from. And um, it was almost impossible to kind of, with just some new concept or some new um, explanation or some just a wish, come up with any kind of change on that. Um, in 2001, two years probably, um, after I, I arrived here in the United States, um, in a stubborn attachment to my Francophone Haiti or to my Francophone self, I decided to, to, with the support of my partner and a friend, we decided to take over a male Haitian order bookstore that was operating from a friend's garage. The dream goal was to modernize the, 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 the bookstore, to make it an online francophone bookstore, to reach out to this culturally vibrant francophone community. It was New York, after all, uh, out organized cultural events. And so we did, and it, it lasted 12 years. Um, it was a Haitian book center. Um, we held a Haitian book day every year in Queens. In fact, the six last years with the collaboration at your college, with the collaboration of the Modern Language Department, I will be forever grateful for that. Um, inviting Haitian authors from Haiti, um, Quebec, France, um, organizing events where the community had to like meet with these authors, furnishing books to public libraries in French and Creole, uh, in the United States. But when I say we, understand friends and family, because at no point in the whole enterprise, we could hire, afford to hire anybody. And the thing is that for 12 years, I worked without a salary doing that. We called it cultural activism. I convinced myself that Francophone literature and Haitian literature deserved it. Throughout the years, I confirmed my true Francophone identity in New York through this activity that was good 12 years. Um, through my doctoral studies, my enduring teaching of French and Creole, a, book, a big majority of it in the CUNY system, and at high school levels in my personal and intimate life. In fact, my, my, my joy now um, is like my daughter speaks to me and to her father in a combination of, because now she's an adult, in a combination of uh, Creole and French. And uh, she went to this age where after college, kids from immigrant families forgo English in, inside the family and reclaim their like immigrant identity. 
So, and this is my, my forever joy to see that the French and English, she did, French and Creole she didn't want to speak in the house just came out like this. And then this is what she speaks to me right now, most of the time. Um, if anything, that's me who wants to speak English to her right now, because I need to kind of have some kind of everyday English in my life. Um, so uh, I, I could confirm that Francophone identity and have it, because if there was one thing I wanted to not lose, that was that um, this complexity that was me. Um, and uh, as, a, as a form of conclusion here, I, I wish I could claim and bring to the forefront a French New Yorkese community that would, you know, gather all the francophones, the multiple Franco possible francophones of New York. But I'm afraid it might be just another construct, another fantasy because I didn't meet that community. Uh, I would like to suggest that we are many French or Francophone pods in New York, as we are cultures and nationalities. We cross paths at the Alliance Francaise, rarely, at the Maison Francaise of Colombia and NYU sometimes, and even then English kind of sometimes take over, takes over. And then we go after that to our families, to our close ones and to our like own pod. Um, my possibly Haitian Francophone community has switched French. This is what I, I realized. Uh, my Haitian Francophone community in uh, New York, in New York has, has switched French, the old master to English a modern master. I'd like to contend that there was and there is loss in the way, in the process. What the other French New York communities may have lost or gained is for them to find out and to share. But I thought we could start a conversation from this story that is like mine. I think I might have this going over my time and I'm going to um, switch over to Lisandro. Um, and I would come back to me if anything, if there is the need to, we, I'll, I'll be more than happy to answer some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Jasmine. Uh, very interesting. And I want to thank um, Esther Allen. I want to thank uh, the staff that's put it together, Allison. Uh, this uh, uh, wonderful uh, panel uh, on post monolingual New York. Um, the, um, what I want to uh, emphasize here today and what I'll be presenting here today is really based on the research that I did at the Coleman Center. And I once again I thank the Coleman Center after all these many years for the wonderful uh, support there which was quite a few years ago, and it took me quite a bit of time to finish this book. Um, but it's, what I'm going to say is really based on, on the book that I wrote as a result of that, of that fellowship. And if we could start the, uh, the slide, if you have that. Um, so uh, I put these up, not because I'm hawking the books or anything like that, but because again, so you're aware that this is the title of my project also for the translators. Uh, in the audience and in the panel and so forth. Uh, it has been translated um, into Spanish, but it circulates really only in Cuba because it was uh, published by Casa de las Americas. So what I'm dealing with in this book um, is actually the Cuban community in New York uh, in the 19th century. Um, from what I believe is the beginning of it in 1823, until really uh, the war, um, the, the Spanish-Cuban-American War, 1898. Um, and uh, what I want, I'm actually a sociologist by training who's uh, um, um, been daring enough to do history here, but nevertheless, I approach this like a sociologist. So a lot of my uh, 
uh, information comes from the sort of census information that that Ava shared uh, with us earlier, uh, looking at the census and so forth. It actually was the largest community of Latin Americans east of the Mississippi until about um, 1886, when then another community of Cubans in Ybor City took over. Uh, its origins and the reason it became such a large community uh, is because its origins was on what was called the sugar trade, which was one of the important areas of trade uh, between the US and the world, uh, and which brought uh, a lot of the, almost all of the production of Cuban sugar um, during the period in which Cuba experienced and started experiencing uh, the, uh, uh, a sugar boom or a sugar revolution shortly after the uh, elimination of the production in Saint Domingue, of course, which up to that point were Haiti, which up to that point was the world's largest producer of sugar. This migration involved <clears throat> people coming back and forth. There was a bridge built between Manhattan uh, and, and Havana, uh, in which brought over a lot of the uh, of uh, sugar traders, uh, a lot of the elite that owned land, and many of them came to study and came to study English, came to study new commercial uh, sort of um, relations and uh, the new commercial sort of um, workings of the commercial system uh, in the US. And eventually that community uh, started also becoming very political, politically active in the separatist struggles uh, that enveloped Cuba starting at about the 1850s and starting of course with the annexationist movement, which was the first uh, manifestation of Cuban separatism. And a lot of that activism, and that's part of what I have in my book, is actually based in New York, right? A lot of the leaders of the separatist movement from Cuba uh, started coming to New York as early as the 1820s, as we'll see, uh, but really intensified in the 1850s. And then when war breaks out in 1868, uh, you have a tremendous number of Cubans that are coming over, many of whom had been in New York before, many of them had been educated in New York, but now they were coming more permanently because the situation was politically very difficult for them. And this migration uh, uh, lasted until about 1880s, uh, and then, of course, we have the start again of the independence movement in 1895. Now, that's basically what the book covers or what the books cover. When Esther asked me to do this, uh, it's for the first time, really, that I started thinking about language. That is, it's not something that, that came up in the course of my research. It was, in this community, in many ways, not an issue. Not an issue the way it is, for example, today. Uh, in which there is this, you know, uh, um, controversy over the use of, the, of languages and, and, uh, and, um, and uh, the attempt to impose uh, some monolingual and English only types of standards. Uh, the Cubans that I researched back then, uh, it's, it wasn't an issue so much. And so it got me to thinking about whether or not, if we go back this far, 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, essentially before the great immigration, great European immigration, whether we're talking about a pre-monolingual New York, right? In which if we can talk about uh, the great uh, migration from Europe and its large numbers that came in, it's when perhaps the issue of language became contentious in the context of the pressure for assimilation, right? And the pressure for the groups to assimilate. Because the Cubans I'm studying in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, didn't think that was a problem for them. They could merrily go on with their Spanish and also, as we'll see, with their English. So uh, there wasn't a trend at that time towards imposing a certain, posing English or a certain hegemony uh, of English. And I think, again, that started happening with the press pressure for assimilation later on. And certainly English uh, was not vested with any degree of superiority uh, among those who came uh, from Cuba as probably happened with other groups. So let me, if we go to the next slide, one of the first individuals that I try to, that I, um, that I talk about in my book was Father Felix Varelli Morales who arrived in New York in December of 1823. Uh, and uh, he thought he was gonna be here only for a very little amount of time, 
but he ended uh, up he ended up spending the next 30 years of his life here because he was not able to return to Cuba. The Spanish actually had a death sentence on him. And when he first came in, uh, one of the things he wrote in his diary was the following about English. And he said, the whistling sound of English rings in my ears like impertinent flies, making it hard to write comfortably in Spanish. So for Varela, actually, English was, you know, a sort of an annoyance. One week after Varela arrived in 1823, another uh, Cuban writer, Cuban important figure, next slide, please, uh, arrived. And he was the poet Jose Maria Heredia, who became known uh, even in the U.S. for his ode to Niagara, uh, to Niagara Falls. <clears throat> and he was a little bit, even though he had this tremendous admiration for the United States, he had absolutely none for the English language. And this is what he writes uh, also when he came to New York. My soul becomes oppressed and I even want to die when I realize that my only hope rests in living the rest of my life among these people, hearing their horrible language, a language that is all anomalies. And I can hardly understand how such a great people has convinced itself to use such execrable gibberish. So that, that was the view of English. It certainly wasn't the case that, that these uh, arrivals felt uh, that uh, English was something uh, to be aspired to necessarily. But nevertheless, right, Varela, who stayed for the next uh, 30 years in New York, did learn English very well. And in fact, most of those who followed Varela in the, in the Cuban community in New York were bilingual. Many of them had actually studied uh, in uh, the United States before arriving as, as, as students. Uh, and bilingualism, I think, became a norm and it became really a strategy. There were two things that in the political activism of the Cuban community uh, they wanted to do. One was to present the cause of an independent Cuba before the US. And certainly the annexationists were not in favor of independence, but again, they had to convince people in the US to annex Cuba. Later on, when we get into the independence movement, uh, various uh, uh, political groups and political activists in the Cuban community in New York wanted the United States to support the independence movement. So there was an audience that obviously had to be addressed in English, right? But at the same time, they have their community to address, and more importantly, Cuba. So there was what one, uh, what Rodrigo Lasso calls, and in fact, his book on this, uh, he's um, uh, a, uh, a literature person here in, in the US and in, in out west, what Rodrigo Lasso calls his book, Writing to Cuba, right? So the notion that, that since they had presumably freedom here of being able to publish and and to and to publish what they what they uh, could what they couldn't be and on behalf of Cuban independence that they were going to write to Cuba and to their compatriots. So this was part of sort of the separatist movement, right? On the one hand, writing to Americans, writing to the U.S. government, writing to the U.S. press, and that had to be done in English. And on the other hand, writing essentially to their compatriots and to Cuba, and that was a bilingual enterprise. Right? And a lot of the uh, Spanish publications, essentially, were small newspapers that sometimes, so many of them were short-lived. The earliest one uh, appeared in 1846-47, and it was called La Verdad, The Truth, and it was a newspaper published by elites, sugar holders, many of whom, and slave owners, who uh, wanted uh, to essentially annex uh, Cuba to the US because they felt that this was in many ways the best way to save slavery. And they had a newspaper. And that newspaper was published in Spanish and it was published, parts of it was also published in English. Um, I think that the best uh, example of a effort in English uh, to reach an American audience, next slide please, uh, was this publication in 1873, which appeared after the 1868 war. And it's called, as you can see, The Book of Blood. And it's published in New York, first in 1871 and then in 1873. 
It is a book documenting atrocities by the Spanish against uh, the Cubans who had risen up for independence in 1868. And it contains a very documented list of people imprisoned, of people deported, of people uh, executed, right? And this was published in two editions in New York. And I think this was, a, a, again, a tremendous, um, a, a tremendous work of propaganda, if you will, uh, that the Cuban community did uh, in English. Right? The most effective uh, spokespersons uh, for Cuban independence, and I'm talking about particularly linguistically uh, most effective, uh, were these two individuals. If I could uh, have the next slide, please. Uh, I'm sorry, let's go, let's go to the next one, uh, if we could, and maybe come back to that one. Yes, these two individuals. Uh, they were arrived in the 1868-1870 period to New York as youngsters, uh, and they were raised in New York. Gonzalo de Casada is actually a, college, a graduate of City College. And both of these were very articulate uh, ex uh, exponents of the US um, essentially um, supporting the independence movement of 1895. Right? Um, and like I said, Gonzalo de Casada actually got his law degree, I believe, from NYU. He's a his undergraduate degree from City College. And Fidel Pierra was a man who prided himself in trying as much as possible to place articles in Cuban public in, in U.S. publications in English, in an attempt to uh, uh, get the U.S. interested in uh, the cause of Cuba. This was, by the way something that happened after Jose Marti, and I'll get to Marti later, died in 1895, because Jose Marti always be never believed that it was a good business, that it was a good idea to get the US interested in the cause of Cuba. And of course he was in that sense, uh, absolutely right. But when he dies, the, his party in New York falls into the hands of individuals like Gonzalo de Quesada, Fidel Pierra, Tomas Estrada Palma, individuals who actively lobbied for U.S. support for the independence movement, if not entry into the into the uh, into the war, and of course that happened, right? Eventually, that happened. The press in New York had a great deal to do with it, and many of these individuals who were uh, communicating in English, right, uh, to the press and to the public in the United States, had a great deal to do with that. And again, a lot of Cuban, particularly Cuban nationalist historians, felt that this had been a, with hindsight, uh, a mistake. Martí saw it with foresight, right? But uh, with hindsight, the idea of interesting the U.S. in this was a mistake. Could we go now back to the other slide, please? I'm sorry, I, I went out of sequence here. So I, I cannot fail to mention in talking about language that what is widely regarded as the Cuban novel of the 19th century was actually written and published in New York, and it was called Cecilia Valdez, O La Loma del Angel. Uh, it was written by Cirilo Villaverde, uh, which with a lot of help, many people believe from his wife, uh, Emilia Casanova. Uh, it was finished, written in Harlem. Uh, in fact, uh, I have the census form, uh, Ava, where they lived when he wrote this. And it is the, the, uh, the Cuban novel of the 19th century in the sense that it is a broad novel about costumbres, about customs and so forth. There's a great deal about racial exploitation, uh, gender exploitation in the movie. Uh, I'm sorry, in the movie, it was made into a movie actually, uh, but in this, in this novel. And, uh, and one of the things that's interesting about it is that it is not an immigrant novel. That is, the novel doesn't pass through New York, right? The novel could have just as easily been written uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Cuba, and maybe that's one reason why it's become such an iconic uh, uh, piece of literature. So if we jump ahead too to the next one, and I wanna finish of course with Jose Marti, and I'm sure Esther Allen, who is uh, you know, Marti's uh, principal translator, I would appreciate this because Marti uh, actually did become bilingual, well, uh, at least enough to earn his living partly in New York, uh, from translations and, and making translations. And uh, he arrived in 1880. And of course he organized in the latter years, the independence movement, and he goes to Cuba in 1895. And he, 
uh, and he's killed, of course, uh, when, uh, when he returns to Cuba in the midst of the war. Uh, we have another vision for Martí here, also of English, because Martí realized very early that if he was going to make a living in New York, he needed to know English, right? which again, he did, he learned, and he did translation. So here's what he writes to a friend in 1882. He's just arrived uh, two years before he had arrived. And he, a friend of his writes, sort of asking, you know, do you think I'll be able to make a living in New York? And this is Marti's quote, which is one of my favorite quotes and very little known. He says, and, and again, all of these are my translations um, uh, that I'm doing from Spanish. And, uh, and here's what Marti wrote. You are interested in knowing whether you can find a way to make a living in New York. In my judgment, that depends solely on things I assume you master. First of all, the language of this land. Right? And, he says, your determination. You must summon all your determination to enter the herd in which the workers of this city live. But it is a herd of kings. So he was a, he was a confirmed New Yorker in that. So I, I appreciate very much this invitation because it got me thinking about these different language issues. Uh, something I hadn't thought about in the many years I was working on this research and how essentially language and particularly bilingualism had its function uh, in, in, uh, in the Cuban community that I have been studying. So I'd like to turn it over then uh, to Damien, uh, uh, who is, uh, uh, who's uh, going to uh, continue with the panel, Damien. Thank you. Um... This is also fascinating. I'm here as kind of the outlier in the panel, although maybe the inlier in the conference as a whole, since I'm here as a, as a translator. Um, I'm mostly, so that means there, there are two of me in my presentation. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the book that Salvatore mentioned, which is uh, a great artifact of post monolingual New York. And then just a little bit about my experience um, and try and leave some time for questions. I think my time's almost up right now, but I uh, will try and keep it brief. Um, so the book uh, that Salvatore mentioned is called Anniversaries by uh, a German writer, a major young German writer uh, of the 60s named Uwe Janssen, like Johnson. In fact, when he lived in um, England, he said, just call me Charlie because no one can pronounce Uva, so you can call him Charlie Johnson, but he's Uva Johnson. And um, he wrote a novel about a 34-year-old German uh, woman named Gesina and her German daughter, Marie, living uh, on the Upper West Side in New York City, um, having emigrated in 1961. Um, and the uh, the book takes place from 1967 to 1968. Um, here it is, both volumes, it's long, because there's uh, it takes place over a year and each day of that year is a chapter. So that adds up to a lot of chapters. Um, and it's a it's the it's really, I think arguably the great New York novel certainly in the conversation with James Baldwin's Another Country and any other pinnacle New York novel you want to name. And it was written in German, mostly, by a German writer. Um, the, the story is about these immigrants, but the fact that they're two different generations as the main character creates this very rich and vibrant um, novelistic situation. When they came over, Marie, the daughter, was three and a half. So by this point in the book, Marie is 10. She is definitely more American than German, while her mother is definitely more German than American. And that plays out on the language level in terms of slang and accents and when they choose to speak to each other in German versus English, all of which is in the book, um, it plays out on the sort of social or moral level where um, Gesina, the mother, is sort of 
shocked by some casual racist comment that the daughter brings home while at the same time, Gesina is telling Marie stories about her childhood in Nazi Germany. So they both are really looking at these other um, cultural experiences from different positions and yet there they are living in New York. So it's, um, it's a great novel of the kind of acculturation experience as well as multilingual New York experience. Um, I did think that I should read a little bit. Um, the thing about the, the book is that it's so, uh, mostly so granular, it's so rich in the experiences of being in New York, of how you fold the New York Times to read it standing up in a crowded subway on your commute, or the line of mourners going blocks and blocks through Midtown leading to St. Patrick's Cathedral after RFK's assassination, or um, you know, this, the sunset over the Hudson, all of these New York experiences that of course it's impossible to really capture in any reading, much less a really abbreviated one. Um, there, there is one sort of early in the book, very early in volume one, uh, a sort of panoramic multilingual New York passage that I thought I would just read so that he's one of the presenters here. Um, this is a flashback from 1967 to 1961 when they've just shown up in the country and are looking for an apartment and Marie doesn't speak English yet. And so the she is Gesina, the mother. Would she have stayed in this country if not for the apartment by the river? Probably not. So skipping down. On her first trip to New York, Gesina had ridden the number five bus down Riverside Drive, the inside edge of a wide artificial landscape that starts with a promenade along the river then continues as you move inland with a multi-lane divided expressway and practically horticultural on-ramp loops, then a spacious hilly park 50 blocks long with monuments, playgrounds, sports fields, sunbathing lawns, and, be and bench-lined paths for strolling. Only then comes the actual street bordering the park, curved in numerous places, rising gently over graceful knolls and hills, stretching out slender exit fingers toward apartment buildings behind farther green islands. A rarity in Manhattan, a showpiece of the gardener's art and a street with views of trees, the water, a landscape. Back then, Gesina had hoped to someday live in one of these towering fortresses of prosperity, richly ornamented in Oriental, Italian, Egyptian, in any case, magnificent style. She'd thought she could never afford it. Broadway, where it crosses 96th Street, is a marketplace of mostly small buildings with lots of foot traffic to the Irish bar, the drugstore on the southwest corner, the restaurant across the street at the newsstand. Now, as then, meaning 1967, like 1961, Scruffy men stand leaning against the buildings, thieves and fences, drunks, crazies, many of African descent, jobless, sick, some begging. This Broadway is polyglot with accents from every continent, confusingly tackling American English. As you walk along, you can hear Spanish from Puerto Rico and Cuba, Caribbean French, Japanese, Chinese, Yiddish, Russian, various vernaculars of the illegal, and again and again, German as it was spoken 30 years ago in East Prussia, Berlin, Franconia, Saxony, Hesse. The child heard a high bosomed matron wearing an old fashioned dress with a large flower pattern and ribbons harangue in German a short downcast man in a black hat creeping alongside her. And she stood there forgetting all else and noticed Gesina's tugging hand only after a while. It was a whitish gray morning with lots of people on the street moving carefully through air thick with moisture and the intersection promised a memory of Italy on many mornings to come. And it goes on a bit and then she of course gets the apartment where 
they live for the course of the novel on uh, 96th and Riverside Drive. Um, so that's the New York that this German writer who uh, was living in New York for two years um, and then writing about New York for the rest of his life to finish the book um, was experiencing. And um, I want to just um, bring up one more place that the book covers as a, as a transition. So this is um, the part of Riverside Park that, um, that our main characters can see out their window. The morning is cool, bright, and dry in the park. This playground sprinkled with white light is a part of Gesina's earliest days in New York. Here's where Marie brought her in contact with her first neighbors. This morning, she's sitting on one of the benches around the edge of the arena and looking down at the half-naked children running in circles in the taut intersecting jets of water from the three sprinklers. Um, a bit later, uh, we get the playground across from our building, surrounded without and watched over within by tall old trees, is, an is a large enclosure on several levels, starting with a big flat area at the north end full of slides, seesaws, sandboxes, and fenced in groups of swings, and bordered by mostly broken green benches. This zone opens out into a circular space surrounded by high walls, and in it, a concentric area ringed by a metal fence. At a break in the wall on the southern edge, steps lead up to a terrace of benches, picnic tables, and an attendance hut that looks like a little castle, followed by more steps up to the highest level, some 15 feet above the playground. So the reason I wanted to read those little blips among the oceanic, immensity of all the other moments in the novel um, has to do with my own experience. Um, I grew up in what seemed to be monolingual New York. I didn't speak other languages at home. My parents didn't either. Um, and I grew up three blocks away from, where, from the apartment where Gazina lived and that playground that um, Uwe Janssen just described is the park that I went to every day as a kid for years and years. Um, and I mean, my whole childhood is that park. And um, many years later, I discovered that this great German writer had written a gigantic novel about my neighborhood. And years after that, I read it. And years after that, I translated it. And so, it turns out that my monolingual New York wasn't monolingual all along. Um, one of the things that was so um, intellectually interesting about translating this book is how it raised these questions of translation. What is it I'm doing if I'm trying to bring into English dialogue that supposedly took place in English that a novelist is writing in German or descriptions of places that could not be more um, local to me. In, in the sort of translation studies or translation theory world, people uh, very often talk about there being these two different places and the translator brings a text into English or else you know, makes it still seem foreign and sort of pulls uh, an assumed local monolingual monocultural reader towards more cultural diversity. So there are these two different places and translation is moving from one to the other. But, but what was moving where when I'm translating this description of my childhood playground? Um, and that made me think, you know, as a translator or um, as the multilingual person I became after childhood, if I'm sitting on one of those park benches reading a book in German, 
I'm not going anywhere. I'm not carrying anything anywhere. I'm just experiencing something different the same way I would if I'm reading anything. Um, if I'm reading something in English, it's giving me new perspectives. It's describing things in a way that I may not have known or else it's giving me back my own perspective in a very um, homogenous way. That could be true of something I'm reading in another language too. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just in a space where um, there are various kinds of information or experience I have access to and various kinds that I don't. And so I started to see my role as a translator just as reorienting like who has access to what um, as opposed to this idea of bringing something somewhere. I'm writing a book called The, the Philosophy of Translation and I really um, increasingly came to, to, to feel that, that every space is a polylingual hybrid, somehow non-homogenous space, no matter how much we want to imagine these two separate poles, you know, uh, a classics professor translating Plato, you know, nobody's bicultural in uh, English and classical Greek. And yet that professor studied Greek at university. There were universities for, let's say, him to go to. Um, Greek was taught there. Greek was valued. There are editions of Plato in Greek that he has access to. There's a community of other readers and reviewers that also speak Greek. The, the Greek isn't from Mars, it's part of the complicated multilingual nature of the culture in the same way that, you know, this German perspective on New York, um, was sort of there all along. It was just waiting for me to find it. And then now that I've translated it, it's there for other um, members of the New York community to have access to. So that was the perspective that I wanted to bring to the panel. And, I, and let me stop there so we have a, a little time. But um, thank you so much for bringing me together with these uh, fascinating, actually multilingual <laughs> New Yorkers. <laughs> I, you know, if we had actually orchestrated it so that all of your remarks sort of, you know, connected with each other and interwove, and I don't think we could have done a better job. I have to say we didn't actually orchestrate that. <laughs> but um, the, the themes that you all brought out uh, were so uh, resonant with each other. Um, and, and I want to thank you. As it turns out, we don't really have any questions from the audience. I think that the Gmail account has gone silent because everyone is in awe of your brilliance, your collective brilliance. But I wondered if we might dedicate the last few minutes of the program to your uh, questions or observations about what each other has said. Um, Jasmine, you'll need to unmute yourself. You're still mute for the moment. Um, so would, would any of you like to... Uh, address a question or two to the others? Well, let me, let me, this was something that I was going to communicate later to, to Ava. And, um, I, and it shows a bit how all of these things, these are not silos, right? These are uh, even in time, and they're not even in time silos, and they're not ethnically silos. Because one of the things that I do have in my book is that I found a fair number of um, uh, Chinese uh, laborers who had gone to Cuba starting in 1847 under contract labor ar ar arrangements, who by a decree of 1860, if their contract was not renewed, had to leave Cuba. And the quickest way to get out of Cuba uh, was on a ship to New York because that's where the ship traffic was. And I found in the census, right? Uh, again, our friend, the census, a number of uh, individuals who were working as uh, domestic servants in the homes of um, um, wealthy Cubans in New York who had brought their domestic servants over. And some of them in fact were in fact born in China. Uh, and I've seen passenger manifests 
uh, which have from Cuba arriving in New York, uh, sometimes as many as 12, 13, 14 men with Spanish first names, born in China, who said they indicated they were on their way to China. And I've always wondered if many, in many ways they never made it to China, but actually stayed in New York. And that was one way in which the Chinese community in New York grew, perhaps not very significantly, but uh, that's something that I haven't followed up on, but it might be something that, that Ava might have run into, I don't know. Certainly as a food writer, Ava, you have a lot to say about that. <laughs> Well, and, and two blocks away from from that description was the Cuban Chinese restaurant, of course, that you know I grew up around the corner from. And I remember at some point it hitting me like, why is there a Cuban Chinese restaurant? And and now I'll find out the answer. It closed, by the way, recently. Oh, yes, yeah, sad, so sad, sadly. Um, so so I haven't researched. Um, the uh, the Cuban Chinese um, uh, migration patterns, but I do know that my great grandfather. There were a lot of um, Chinese living in Cuba. Even today, there's a there are small Chinatowns um, in Cuba and um, in Havana. Yes. And uh, I know that my um, great grandfather, the one in the family portrait sitting with the bow tie on the left um, from his Chinese Exclusion Act file did indeed go to um, visit Havana. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I, it was, I believe to do business. Um, and, uh, but I don't, I haven't really researched or, or I don't know a great deal about it, but thank you, Lissandro for, for mentioning it. Cause it's, it's sort of been on my radar and it's uh, one of the other things that I need to, to look up. Sounds like another book project. <laughs> um, if if I if I if I have time, I would like to ask a question to that to, to Damian. Actually, you just said something very interesting. Uh, you're the only a person in the panel who said I kind of was raised in a monolingual New York. Like for you, um, that existed. There was such thing that existed, and of course, I think I read somewhere that you not only are translated from German, but you also worked in other, many other languages, uh, if, I, if I understand. Now, my question to you, because um, I, we are speaking about the languages like if they were all equal. My languages, myself, are like on planes that are very different from one another. And that's why I, I call about, I talk about power dynamic, and I don't think the power dynamic changed when we immigrate from our place to the place that we bring it in with us. Do you think your post-monolingual New York, the one you were raised with, is the same as the post-monolingual, I mean, the monolingual New York mm -hmm. the same, is the same as the one they're claiming right now and the one we're trying to kind of undo? That is a very good, sharp question, you know, because um, not only are we talking about the, you know, the language it's possible to be monolingual it with in, in New York, but English is, the, is a world dominant language. So if you just look in terms of whether you're talking literary translation or technology, you know, or whatever else, clearly English is not in the same position as any other, as any other language, certainly the, as most other languages, there are other global languages, but I think the case is still pretty convincingly made that English is, you know, even more dominant than the other global languages. Um, and so could I, could I be in the perspective that I'm describing if it wasn't English? If I was raised um, monolingually in some other community in some other language, would I then be able to attain this sort of utopian multilingualism that I was kind of gesturing towards when I said like, oh, New York was multilingual all along. There were these, you know, there are these icons of German literature describing my park where I'm playing handball at age eight. And when I'm eight, it was just the wall I 
played handball, but now it turns out that it exists in this kind of rich multilingual post monolingual space. Um, but your question puts even more sharply, you know, um, I, I assume you mean the, the, the monolingual New York being advocated for today in the sort of political context of Spanish is bad and immigrants are bad and dark skinned people are bad and everything that isn't, you know, hegemonic white English Republican in America is bad. Um, and, you know, I guess, I guess what I'd have to say is that the, when I talk about growing up in monolingual New York, I mean that kind of in quotation marks because in my perspective now, it wasn't monolingual back then. It never is. It was always sort of porous and open to these other languages and cultures. The way my example of the Greek professor, you know, he's not in a non Greek speaking culture. People aren't walking around on the streets speaking ancient Greek, but ancient Greek has penetrated that culture and infused it and affects it in various ways. And so, you know, my current understanding of how culture works is that there are no monolingual cultures. And so when I talk about, I grew up in monolingual New York, I mean that kind of as shorthand, I didn't speak any other languages, but even though I didn't know it at the time, it wasn't rigidly monolingual. So that I guess is my, um, you know, perhaps self-serving, but also kind of intellectually honest take on my understanding of being monolingual not matching the kind of current political, much more aggressive and, and, and reductionist understanding of it. Um, that's the best I could do on the spot for that really tough question. But what do you, I mean, can you tell me what you think? Me? Yeah, yeah, about- oh, Well, you know, I, about I don't want to, I really don't want to thank something. It's just that I, I found out while myself was trying to reflect on my own experience and while I, I, I was um, hearing each one of you passionately enough, I found out that it's interesting how we kind of trying to, we did, we pulled the languages out of their, I would say nest, and we try to see if we can speak about them, but it's so, f we, we stay in the formal, um, in the formal aspect of it. But I think what is nourishing the dynamic it, it, between these languages is something like, I wish we had another hour to kind of go into <laughs> how these languages are actually living right now, because you know, German, and Chinese and Spanish are not living in the same way French and Creole and um, I don't know, whatever Japanese, whatever other language is living. And then I think the vibrancy of what we're saying right now, I kind of feel so much life and we don't have time really to tap into it. I, 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 I don't want to be too political, but it's just that for me, there was a deep political aspect of it that we kind of just like lifted a little part of and there was so much to be said. I was just curious, that's it. I'm very grateful to you for being political, Jasmine, because this was exactly the idea of this program. Um, there's, a, there's a false narrative, uh, you know, that has been implemented nationwide uh, in a certain way. And I think everything that all of you have said is such a valuable corrective to that utterly false narrative, um, which must be corrected at every moment, um, you know, about who the people of this country are. Um, and I do wish we had at least another hour, if not two or three, <laughs> to continue. Unfortunately, we've already run over time. And also, this is the by far the richest evening of our conference because we have another event at 8 p.m. with Maria Davna, speaking of the ancient world, Damien, with Maria Davna Headley and Emily Wilson, who will be discussing their respective translations of uh, Homer and of uh, Beowulf. So we do have to conclude. You've all been absolutely wonderful. 
I think that this is going to be an extraordinary resource for teachers. The recording of this, uh, which will live on for many years, no doubt. And um, thank you all so much. Yes, thank Allison, you. Thank you. This thank has you, been wonderful. Allison you're, and Esther. You're a great group. Allison, do you want to read us out with our thanks to our sponsors? Yes, of course. Once again, we'd like to thank our partners, HowlRound, PEN America, the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, and to the Princeton University Program in Translation and Intercultural Communication for their support of this evening's event. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Oh, and nice uh, <laughs> see you on the Columbia University site in about 20 minutes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Bye. Thanks.